aware of the sort of the importance of missing episodes because obviously Tomb of the Cybermen was missing for many years, Michael, and then it came back in the early 90s. Were you aware that it was missing prior to then? Yes, I was, because uh, the important thing for an actor, really, about uh, being in a television show, particularly such a, a legendary series as Doctor Who, is whether you're going to get any residuals. <laughs> That's the important thing. And when you discover that the one you were in was lost, you think, so then when you found, when you discover that it's been found, which I believe was in a cupboard in the BBC's office in Hong Kong, is that right? It was found uh, in the Far East, yes. Yeah, in the Far East. They're, they're, they're wonderful because uh, one's been getting a few pennies here and there ever since. So that's the important sort. Is, is that rather letting the side down? Is it? I think that's a that's total really honest good. answer there, yeah, actually. I agree with that. I think a few pennies is a help, isn't it? <laughs> um, Sonny, obviously we've got a couple of episodes of the Ice Warriors still not around, and are you aware of the importance of missing episodes? Yes, years ago, BBC was very mean. In a sense, they never kept any recording. They wiped the tape off and used it in another episode. And that's what they kept doing, and we keep losing a lot of important stuff. But now we are finding bits and pieces, and we are trying to put it together. For that matter, I went up in the country sometime, and I had to fill in a few bits for the evils of the diet, Dalek, that they lost, which I hope will help renew everybody's interest in it. But as far as I'm concerned, it helps a lot, money-wise. <laughs> <laughs> you both played um, iconic... Um... Can, I, can I just uh, add something to what Sonny said, Sonny said about BBC being mean? When I was first asked to do uh, the uh, cyber controller, uh, I, my agent rang me and said they're offering you uh, whatever it was, I can't remember now the fee, but it was, it was rather below my substantive fee, because I've done a few bits and pieces over the years for the BBC, and you gradually you, you work your fee up, and that, that is all level. But they wanted to give me what they rather grandly call a special loan, which meant that you, you only got a, a, a lower fee than usual, but it, it wasn't, you didn't have to start again and work your way up again. It would only be for just for that particular production. So I said, well, why a special loan? You know, for this Doctor Who, after all, it's the principal villain in the character. And my agent said, well, they say they're offering you this because uh, you don't have to learn, the, you don't have to say the lines. And I said, no, that's true, I don't have to say the lines, but, but, but I have to learn the lines. Because I don't know if you remember it, he, he had a mouth rather like a post box. It opened. I couldn't say the lines myself because they didn't have then the technology to have a microphone under the costume, on the metallic costume. So it was another actor, Peter Hawkins, top voice man in his day. He was off camera with a microphone. He said the lines. So I had to know the lines because I had to open this thing for the line on cue and then shut it at the end of the line. So I had to learn the lines, even if I didn't have to see them. And the BBC, you said they mean, and they accepted the argument, and they paid up! My full substantive fee. Well, I got news for you. Yeah. <laughs> I got some bells recently, invoices, that I did a few things for them, and they sent me 21 pages of these invoices which they are paying me for these things that I did before. So I looked at it and said, oh, goody, goody, I'm in the money today. When I counted all the pages and everything, at the end of the day, 24 pence. <laughs> <laughs> I thought to myself, Jesus Christ, the last of the big spenders here. <laughs> Just the board sent you all that paper. Yeah, it's all free. They're breaking. It, it costs them more money to bother. 
So there we are. We've had our little beef about the beef. <laughs> but I said another one, actually, the other way around, where they really got stuck with the, when I did the, uh, the robots. We, we did uh, a week's filming, and then there was four weeks uh, in the studio. And we actually, the production, through their fault of it, so ran into two strikes. One was the prop men, so that delayed things, and the other one was the studio managers. So that delayed things even further. My contract was for four episodes, but because of all these delays kept over running, I actually got paid for ten. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and they paid up another, well, it was a contract, it's illegal. Yes. Sorry, there we go. Um, you mentioned about you didn't have to say the lines in Tomb of the Cybermen, but when you came back for Attack of the Cybermen with Colin Baker, uh, were you supposed to be asked to come back and then obviously have to deliver the lines? What was the question? I didn't quite get So when you came back from yeah. Colin Baker's Cyberman yes. story, and you had to, did you have to deliver the lines? Oh, yes, that? yes. By then, the technology had improved, and uh, so the, I, I had a microphone under the costume, so I was able to, to say the lines myself. Not, I think it made a lot of difference, really, because when Peter Hawkins said it, or when I spoke it, the, the, the voice was treated anyway, electronically, so it could have been anyone. But um, the, the thing that upset me slightly about it in a way was when I did it, because uh, it was about well, 13, 14 years, I think, later yes. uh, with the Colin Baker. The, the, this business of the mouth opening <coughs> and shutting had been forgotten. And I thought it was a shame, it was a rather eerie effect. So I just had a, I looked much the same as all the other Simon men, really, and uh, nothing moved in the face at all when, when the lines were spoken. I thought it was a shame that it had been forgotten. But I did speak the lines, yes. So I had to learn them. I didn't get the extra. <laughs> Sonny, the um, Ice Warriors are coming back in Doctor Who in the next couple of weeks. Sorry to spoil it for you all. Uh, what are your memories of the Ice Warrior costume that you had to wear? Oh boy. That was some memories. That was a bloody nightmare. <laughs> I'll tell you for a start. The first time I put that costume on, I put it on about 10 o'clock in the morning. By 12, I heard something going, slosh, slosh, and I'm looking around. So what the hell is that? And it's keep going like this all the time. And my feet is feeling very sluggish in this boots. So I told him to say something in my boots. He said, that's your feet. I said, oh, there's something else in there. He <laughs> said, what do you think it is? I said, you tell me. So they decided to take the costume off. Took it off. Those two rubber boots filled up a whole bucket of water, sweat. I was sweating like mad in there. I wasn't paid for books. John Pertry, any time I met him in London, he used to always shout out to me, Sally! I said, John, how are you doing? He said, how is the water, Mrs. <laughs> <laughs> I was up in the upper Yeah, but um, I guess say something. The Ice Forest costume was one of the most difficult costume I ever wore in my life. It was bolted on my shoulder here and here. And it was bolted between my legs under my groin. And the stomach, as you know, and the back was just the same. Well, <clears throat> when they had to clean me off, the stunt director was Peter Diamond, I think it was. Came up to me, Sonny, which way are you going to fall? I said, you're trying to be funny. He said, why? I said, it's only one or two places I could fall, forward or backwards. How am I going to fall? He said, well, which way will you, will you choose? <laughs> it's the easiest way, don't worry, easiest way. Anyhow, they decided to kill me. And I felt forward. The belly of it hit the ground first, 
my balls hit the second book, but <laughs> shoes in the bottom. And I lie down there and I'm going, that's it. I'm not going to get married again. It's all over. <laughs> <laughs> so, John pushed me one over. He says, Sonny, are you all right? I say, yes, on the chest, sir. I don't what's happened from the chest down. When they took this thing off, I was bruised in between my groin here, where that costume fitted on me. Oh, it was murder. But mind you, I have a very bad way of getting injured down there. Because the first time we did the evils of the Dalek, when I played Kamel, I was supposed to kill Jamie. I rushed to run behind Jamie. Jamie ran onto a roof. I jump over the plank on the roof, slide down the roof, at the end of the roof there's a guttering with hooks on it to hold up the guttering. I'll give you three guess what hooked on. <laughs> I found when you're inside these sorts of costumes, uh, I found this on, in, on the stage as well during those times that people do actually forget there's a human being inside. They do. Uh, and you get sort of stranded, for instance, when I was electrocuted as the uh, cyber controller, I crashed to the floor uh, hoping that that would be at the one tick because it's quite painful. And I waited, and I waited, and I waited, and nobody said anything, nobody did anything. And all the lights had gone out. It was a tea break. <laughs> and I'd, I'd just been left there. It was too late. I couldn't get up on my own. I had to shout for help. So they, and I do remember uh, Chris, Chris Barry coming in once again when I was standing uh, forever in the robot costume, which was the toughest one I ever had. And uh, I'd been there for ages in the studio. And I, I tried to zen myself out, you know, to go into a zone whereby I was semi-conscious but not very successfully. And he said, uh, uh, brightly said, you're right there, Michael. And I said, no, I, well, I'm not. <laughs> I didn't realize that you're suffering inside. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> it's very difficult. And the other thing is, of course, about those costumes, uh, you, you always have a dresser, don't you, to sort of get you in it and screw you in and so on. Now their job is to have you ready for the director, when the director and the cameraman, where they want to go, you've got to be ready. If you're not, you know, they're, they're in trouble. So they always tend to get you ready too early. Don't they? Too so early. They're saying, oh, we need, we've got another 10, 15 minutes, so no, we need, oh, no, they've got to get you in it. So you spend more time in it than you need, really. And my, um, I, I didn't have the, the problems with my nether regions that you did, or with the, uh, but I did have nasty dreams with the robot. When I finished filming, I went home, drove home after the, we had a week filming, and I drove home. And uh, that night I had this awful nightmares about being trapped in a midget submarine. <laughs> the next morning when I got out of bed, it, it, my legs just collapsed, I couldn't stand, my legs wouldn't hold me. My wife was very concerned, wanted to ring the doctor, but I said, no, I think I'll be all right. And, uh, by lunchtime, I was more or less back to normal. But you see, you, you people sitting at home in the comfort of your armchairs, watching us suffer, they don't realize to me. Anything for art. Anything for art. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty well everything. I could remember once, when I played part of Camel, the first stunt I had to do was a fall over a banister onto a table, and the table will crash onto the ground, and I will fall on the floor. So I looked at that piece of cake, because I'm doing that with my eyes closed. Because up in there, I saw one of the legs of the table, so the table now is balancing on three legs, and the other leg is just there. Fall over on the table, the table never broke, because the other legs, I'm still up there. I says, the table never broke. Okay. I saw the other leg. I came over there. Fell over again. Still the table never broke. <laughs> so now they saw, now the table is only on one leg. But three sticks standing there. 
They said, if you break down, I said, okay. So I got out there, climb up. Before I fall over the table broke. <laughs> <laughs> I let everybody look at me. They said, did you touch it? I said, no, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, um, what are your memories of Pat Triton? Mine, yes, yes. Oh, uh, I loved him. I, uh, he was such a he was a sweet man uh, and uh, very very good actor, of course. And I had the privilege of uh, I, I did quite a lot of writing in my time, and I, I having played the lead in a radio play that I, I wrote some years later, I was very happy that he was available. He was always my favourite doctor because uh, there was something just slightly sinister. About him. I mean, I know he was on the side of the angels, but you felt that you always felt that uh, he, he could turn quite nasty if you were careful, if you didn't behave yourself. You know. he, he, he was a little sinister, as I say, and I thought that little bit of grit uh, in the character gave, gave it more of an edge. He, he didn't try so hard to be bloody lovable. <laughs> Who am I talking about now? If I remind you. Yes. <laughs> that was Pat Trump, yes. I, I, that, I will agree with you on that. I worked with him on many Doctor Who uh, plays, and uh, he helped me a lot. He was a gentleman. I got to know his son as well. He was just the same in his dad. Beautiful people. When he died, it upset me very badly, because I was very close to him as a friend. And um, the things we did <laughs> in the Doctor Who series was very, very funny. This is a part where I have to lift up, lift up um, on the corner. What's her name? Deborah Watling. Deborah Watling. She was dressed in this old time long dress. And I broke up Deborah, Deborah from the floor, not knowing that I'm still standing on her dress. So, I'm not on the dress because the dress is a long dress. I'm lifted up. I said, shit, Deborah, you put on some weight. <laughs> How are you so heavy? She said, I'm not heavy, Sonny. You're standing on a bloody dress. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't get them off the ground. <laughs> my was very funny. But my, at times I had a doctor who John Poetry and Patrick Charlton was on the end of the They were great guys, they were funny guys, and they made the work very easy for me at least, because everything I did, they brought all the best in me. They were good. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Took them one. It's a shame to all of the greatest actors, actors that we know. <coughs> He's left us, and that's bad. I'm afraid he's bad. But then again, put it this way. We all have to go one day or the other. But then again, there's one thing we don't want to look forward to in life. Don't bloody get old. <laughs> <laughs> you get old, you're in deep shit. <laughs> I think that's the quote of the event. <laughs>